Okay, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, everything I'm going to be talking about is joint work with uh, Larry Guth. I'm going to begin uh, with a very simple definition. Um, a point P in R3 is a joint of the lines L1, L2, L3 if P is in the three lines and L1, L2, L3 are not coplanar. So a point is a joint if the three lines meet there and they are not coplanar lines. So I think that traditionally the next thing I should do is draw a picture of a joint, but it never works because whenever I draw it, it's not a joint. And that's <laughs> somehow fundamentally what's lying behind this talk. Um, but let me tell you an example. Um, in this example, n is going to be uh, an integer so that 3 times n is a perfect square. And you consider um, an n over 3 by n over 3, uh, sorry, square root n over 3 by square root n over 3 by square root n over 3 uh, grid uh, in R3. So I mean you just take the part of the integer lattice up to square root n over 3 in uh, every um, uh, in every in every one of the three coordinate directions. And now um, why is that 3 there? Uh, it's so that I have n uh, n favored uh, lines and coordinate directions, right? Uh, n over 3 in the x direction, n over 3 in the, in the y direction, n over 3 in the z direction, and uh, a, an x line, a y line, and a, a z line always meet um, at one of these lattice points. So we have n lines, and we have, um, well, uh, n to the 3 halves uh, over uh, 3 square root of 3 joints. So this is an example where n lines form n to the three, uh, approximately n to the 3 halves joints. Uh, so now let me state the main theorem. So the theorem is that um, n lines in R3 can never form really many more joints than that. Uh, form big O of n to the 3 halves joints. As far as the exponent, uh, this is a sharp result. So believe it or not, this was uh, an open problem for uh, at least some, some two decades. Um, <laughs> the problem is usually associated with Scharier um, most papers about this problem are, have a collection of co-authors, and Sharir is one of them. Um, so the, the recent best result was, was Feldman Sharir, um, and they had an exponent that was like uh, 1.62. And some harmonic analysts were interested in this problem. I first learned about it from lectures that Tom Wolfe gave in the middle 90s. He viewed the problem as a kind of analog of the, of the Kakea um, maximal problem, uh, I mean of the Kakea set problem. Um, OK, so that's um, actually theorem one. Um, I guess I'm going to state uh, another theorem. And in 40 minutes, I'm not going to have time to prove that both, but they uh, are both proved by, by similar techniques. And if I have a, a spare minute, I might indicate uh, the difference. Um, but theorem two uh, now we have n squared lines in our th in our three p a set of points um, and each line incident to uh, n points. Uh, and one more condition, 
And the extra condition is no more uh, than n lines um, are coplanar. For experts in the Kakea problem, uh, this condition, I hope this doesn't erase it, um, is called a Wolf axiom. What it does for this problem is it makes the lines on hairbrushes essentially disjoint. It makes it possible to run Wolf's Kakea argument for this problem. Well, I haven't said what the problem is. Um, but our result is that, um, that the size of this point set is at least n, to n cubed. Um, this problem was posed by Bourgain at a 2004 AIM meeting at which I think several of us were, were present. Um, Five halves is an immediate result from, from Wolf's Kakea argument. And there was recently a, an improvement by Sholomoshi and Toth. They got 11 fourths. So here are two theorems. They're uh, discrete analogs of the Kakea problem. They live in the world of discrete incidence theory. And um, instead of what usually happens with these problems that we're stuck at some intermediate exponent, we actually get this sharp result. How is it that we can get sharp results in these problems? Uh, it's because we're following uh, the algebraic uh, method of De Vere. De Vere recently solved uh, the finite field uh, Kakea problem, and we are, in some sense, extending, uh, extending his result. So to understand how any of these results work, um, you need to uh, remember your high school algebra really well. So a large part of this um, lecture will be a review of high school algebra. Maybe I could use uh, one frame to say what high school algebra is about. So high school algebra is about the question, what sets do polynomials vanish on? And I could say how to factor polynomials, but I'll say when do polynomials have common factors? I apologize that my handwriting is so, so horribly illegible, and I'm going to strive to now switch format to make it slightly less illegible, um, but this might cause the entire lecture to crash. So let's see. Um, so I'm supposed to press hide here. <laughs> and does anyone want me to zoom in? <laughs> OK. So, so now I'm just going to remind you of a bunch of facts from, from high school algebra, and when I decide to use them, uh, then uh, I'll go back um, to, the, to the main screen. Um, everything that's written here is often stated with a field and a dimension. So I have f to the d, the symbol f to the d appearing on this page in various places. The field that I'm really talking about is r, and the d that I'm really talking about is 3. Um, but at some point, I'm going to remind you how De Vere solved the, the Kakea problem, the finite field Kakea problem. So I'm stating things in slightly more generality. And some of the things that I'm stating are actually false. Uh, because for instance, if you're in the field with p elements, you shouldn't be talking about polynomials whose degree is more than p. Um, but so, so take everything with a slight grain of salt, but you can fall back on your high school algebra and figure it out. So the first fact that we need from high school algebra, I labeled it proposition A, is that if you have an underdetermined system of linear equations that's homogeneous, so you have linear equations, um, fewer equations than unknowns, and you have zeros on the right-hand side, then you have non-trivial solutions. I think, I think we all know that. That's row reduction. Um, and what good is that? How does that relate to the subject of high school algebra as I defined it in the previous frame? Uh, well, it allows us to find uh, polynomials that vanish on sets. If we have some set of points and we'd like to find a polynomial that vanishes on it, 
then we can write down a bunch of linear equations for the coefficients, which say the coefficients vanish at this point, the coefficients vanish at the next point. And then in terms of the number of points, we can uh, get an estimate for the degree of a non-trivial polynomial that will vanish on that set of points. So for instance, uh, if uh, I have a set of points in a finite, in, in any field to, to dimension D, and I'm talking about degrees that are sufficiently small, uh, then there's a non-trivial polynomial whose degree is uh, essentially bounded by um, the size of the set to the power one over D. And if I'm more picky about my polynomials and I want my polynomials say to be homogeneous, so that was corollary one, and corollary two, if I want my polynomials to be homogeneous, then I still get size of E to the one over D minus one. And when d is large, d and d minus 1 are not so different. Um, OK, so now uh, having stated those corollaries, I want to remind you uh, about Dvir's uh, solution of the finite field Kakea problem. Um, great. And I press media marker. Excellent. So Dvir. Oh, show. Thank you. Great, Dvir. So E contained in finite field with P elements, P is a prime uh, to the D is a Kakea set if it contains a line, a line has P points, if it contains a line in every direction. And what Dvir showed, in fact, is that such a set has to have size a constant times p to the, to the d, at least a constant times p to the d. Uh, but he did this in several steps, there by now maybe more direct approaches. But what he, in fact, did in his, in his original paper is that he first showed uh, that size of e, um, let me write that, size of e is at least a constant uh, p to the d minus 1. And in fact, that's sufficient to gain the result I mouthed. Because if you can get Kakea sets up to within co-dimension 1, then what you get to do is you get to direct sum them with one another. Um, and when you do that, you get uh, Kakea sets with twice the co-dimension. And since co-dimension one, more than one is disallowed, that means co-dimension more than one half is disallowed and so forth. So you, you actually get the whole result. And why am I making this big deal about uh, p to the d minus one? Well, that allowed him to get a homogeneous polynomial, which vanished on the whole Kakea set. Now, homogeneous polynomials are really nice. I'm going to try to draw a picture of this. So here's some line which the homogeneous polynomial is vanishing on. But it's, if it's vanishing on the line and it's homogeneous, then it's vanishing on the whole plane spanned by the line and zero. So it's, it's vanishing on this whole plane. And in particular, it's vanishing on the direction of the line. So you have a polynomial that vanishes on the direction of all of the lines, but the lines had all directions. So that means that that polynomial is identically zero. And identically zero polynomials are not non-trivial, so that's a contradiction. So this is how... Um, this is how uh, Dvir disposed of, um, disposed of, the, uh, uh, of the finite field Kakea problem. Um, I, I see now that there's a proposition that didn't quite make it to my, to my notes, so I, I want to take one more frame from it. Um, I should comment that, of course, there are more quantitative versions of, of Dvir, and uh, one thing that, that really gets used in them is what should have been proposition B, uh, which is that if a polynomial of degree D vanishes on D plus one points of a line, it vanishes on the whole line. Now that's really useful. So before we were interested in polynomials 
that vanished on, on sets of points, and we had to pay for our points, right? Whenever we had a set of points, we had, the polynomial had to have degree the set of points to the one over D. Um, but if we have a certain set of points, and some of them happen to happily live along a line, then we might get some extra points for free because we get the whole line for free with this proposition. So that's kind of a useful proposition. Um, okay. Um, so, so now I could, you know, sort of comment that um, solving the joints problem isn't just a direct generalization. Well, certainly not of the version of the proof of De Vere that I just told you, uh, because. Well, we're talking, um, we're talking about R3, um, our set of joints is going to be some very small subset of R3, and we don't really expect to see, uh, I mean, to be able to claim just from the condition that there are a lot of joints that some polynomial will completely vanish. And we have to do something uh, very careful, um, which, you know, keeps, well, which keeps track of degrees and which uses somehow only the lines that are appearing in our problem. So to do that, we need to, we need to use the second part of high school algebra that the, this argument hasn't given. We need to use the part of high school algebra that's about when two polynomials have common factors. So let me remind you about that. Um, I don't know how legible that is, uh, but we'll live with it. Um, so what's supposed to be written on this, on this slide um, are, are two polynomials. Maybe you can't see them, but p of x and g of x, and one of them has degree n, and one of them has degree m. And I want to figure out how do I know whether they have common factors. And you know, you could give all kinds of answers. It's the Euclidean algorithm, but in fact, it's a linear algebra problem. Um, all I have to do is write down a certain matrix and take its determinant. And this is supposed to be the matrix, and actually all you need to make sense of the matrix is to know what its shape is. So there are two kinds of columns in this matrix. One kind of column has the coefficients of the first polynomial, and the other kind of column has the coefficients of the second polynomial. And so we have all of the coefficients of the first uh, polynomial and then some, some zeros, and then we shift those coefficients down one and then some zeros, and we shift down two. And the number of times that we do this is, the, is m, which is the degree of the second polynomial. So the you have the coefficients of the first polynomial, and you shift them the number of times as the degree of the second polynomial. And then you do the opposite thing uh, for the second polynomial. You put this all in a matrix. It's an m, n plus m by n plus m matrix. It's called the Sylvester matrix of the two polynomials. And what it represents is, a, is basically a list of polynomials. The polynomials you started with plus together with powers of x times those polynomials. And what we're testing is whether these are all linearly independent. And the reason we're doing that is that we want to check whether the ideal generated by the two polynomials together is non-trivial or not. And so if the determinant is zero, then the ideal is non-trivial, which means the polynomials have common factors. So that is the, the, really the second main idea in high school algebra. Um, oh, so the determinant is called the resultant, and I denote it by RES. And so there's proposition C. Uh, P and Q have a common factor if and only if the resultant is 0. This was, as stated, a fact about polynomials of one variable. But in fact, it's extremely useful for polynomials of many variables. Um, as the algebraists would say, it works in the function field case too. Um, so you can consider a polynomial of several variables as a polynomial in one variable with coefficients in the rest of the variables. And that's what we're going to do. So for instance, if P and Q are polynomials of several variables, um, again, P and Q have a common factor uh, if and only if uh, the resultant uh, is um, identically zero. Okay, so I, I was a little bit fast and loose with this, and I should have picked a generic coordinate direction because you know there might be some uh, some variable that doesn't appear at all. But if I pick if I pick a generic uh, if I pick a generic coordinate, then all you have to do to check whether um, whether p and q have a common factor is again to check the the resultant is zero, 
And you can use this to show that the set of multivariable polynomials is a, a unique factorization domain, which is uh, an extremely useful fact. Um, but more importantly and more quantitatively, you get from this something called Bazou's lemma. So Bazou's lemma, which is this corollary five, says it's, uh, I'm gonna state this as a planar result. It says that if you have two polynomials of two variables, one polynomial has degree n, the other polynomial has degree m, and these, so these are curves. Um, and then we look at where they intersect. What are the points, how many points are there which um, have both polynomials vanishing at? And if that number is more than nm plus one, um, then the two polynomials must have a common factor. Why is that? Well, you write the resultant of the two polynomials, and that's a polynomial of one variable, and in fact it has degree nm. Maybe that's a little exercise. You have to check that it really has degree nm. And if, uh, if there are more than nm points of vanishing, then the polynomial has more than nm roots, which means it's the zero polynomial, which means that the resultant is zero. So that's the whole idea. Um, and this is Bazou's lemma. It's one of the chief results of high school algebra of the mid-19th century. And um, we can generalize it to a lemma about R3, which is really the thing we're going to use. So now I have exactly the same hypotheses except in R3. I have two polynomials um, of three variables, and one is of degree m, and one is of degree n. And well, um, knowing points where they vanish isn't enough. I mean, you expect the intersection of their zero sets to be kind of one-dimensional. Uh, but if you happen to know that they vanish on a lot of lines, and our problems have a lot of lines in them, so there are a lot of lines for them to vanish on. If you know that they vanish on more than nm plus one lines, then they have a common factor. And it's the same theorem again. The way you prove this theorem is that you pick a direction uh, which isn't, um, which somehow isn't parallel to, to any of these lines, and then you look at cross-sections, and in cross-sections you invoke the previous corollary, and if, if it happened that the resultant vanished at each cross-section, then it just vanishes. Um, so this is, uh, this is in fact uh, the thing we're going to use. So now, um, how am I doing for time? I have about 20 minutes. Yeah, 28. Yes. Uh, no. Where did we go to high school? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it must be 18, right? Uh, you say oh, I'm sorry, 18. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Um, all right. So, oh, I, I should now show. Great. Um, so now I, I can sort of describe, I can describe the plan. Um, what is the plan? For solving, for solving the joints problem. Um, so, of course, uh, we're going to assume we have, we, we don't have a solution to the joints problem, so we're going to assume there are, there are lots of points. Maybe I'll already say this. So we have, uh, we have k n to the 3 halves joints and n lines. And k is something very, very big. And whenever I write less than with a twiddle, the, um, the constant that's implied will be universal and won't depend on k. Won't depend on k and won't depend on n. Um, and now what are we going to do? We're going to find the polynomial. We're going to find a polynomial which vanishes. Um, so let's, call it, let's give the set of joints a name. Let's call it j. Um, and we'll find a polynomial vanishing on j. Uh, of low degree. And I won't specify that yet, although this is a very important point. The thing you should be worried about from now on is what are the degree of polynomials that I'm finding. And, you know, these points are joints from not very many lines, so we expect them, we expect a lot of points like this to lie on lines, so we might expect the polynomial to vanish on, on a lot of lines. So that's good news. The polynomial will vanish on a lot of lines. Now, we also would expect, because when I mean a lot of lines, I mean really a lot of lines, we expect that we'll often have three of these lines that the polynomial vanishes on forming a joint. So we have a polynomial that vanishes on a bunch of lines, and three of those lines form a joint. 
what is the gradient of the polynomial at that joint? You see, the, the zero set of the polynomial is a surface. The polynomial has a tangent plane. And all three of the lines lie in the tangent plane. Wait, they're non-coplanar. The gradient must be zero. So if that happens, the gradient will vanish on all of the joints too. So the polynomial will be p, and gradient p also vanishes on joints. And so they'll vanish together on a bunch of lines. And uh, well, with good luck, this will lead to some sort of a contradiction. For instance, if p were irreducible, um, which we won't know a priori by using these, but we'll deal with that in a minute. Um, if p were irreducible and gradient p had a common factor with it, that would immediately be a contradiction. So this is our plan. OK, so the next thing I should point out is what is, what is the main problem in carrying this plan out? So problem. We only have n lines, right? Um, now, that the Bazou line lemma said that you had to vanish at n, m plus 1 lines. So let's pretend our polynomials have some fixed degree. Um, then, then we need to have degree squared uh, many lines. So that means that we must get we must get degree, which is at least a little less than square root of n. Um, however, we have k n to the 3 halves joints. So if we just apply proposition A, we only get degree k to the 1 third n to the 1 half, which is too big. So we have a problem. We need, to, we need to get this degree a little, um, a little lower, and we have to choose, um, we have to choose the polynomial uh, in a more frugal way. Um, and in fact, we can, and we're going to take advantage of the fact that our assumption is that a lot of points lie on a lot of lines already. That assumption will allow us to take a, a sort of smaller set of points at the beginning, We'll, we'll force a polynomial to vanish on it just by solving linear equations. And then that smaller set of points will imply vanishing on a large set of points. That's what we're going to do. So now let me uh, describe, as only this technology allows me to, um, that set, uh, how, how that's going to work. Um, so so as, as we said, that J has uh, K end of the 3 halves joints. Um, and uh, n lines. And at each joint, color, we're going to color incidences red, green, and blue. This is a bookkeeping device, right? We, in order to keep joints, we need to make sure uh, that we have lines that are not complainer going through, going through these joints. Um, so we'll color red, green, blue, and we'll count red, green, and blue incidences. And now there's a big refinement of, of the set of joints, J prime. Um, um, it's, it's really almost all of J. So there's going to be some subset of, of J, and it's going to be really huge. So at least 99.9% .9 of, of J. Um, and now I have to say so that and switch pages. This is terrible. But um, so that uh, each point of J prime uh, gets its uh, red incidence from a line with at least uh, k, and that's with a constant, but k n to the 1 half red incidences. We started with k n to the 3 halves joints. We only have n lines, so typically you have k n to the 1 half uh, incidences. So, and we'll call, we'll give this set of lines a name. The set of lines will be LR. So we have this good set of lines. They're about n lines. They're maybe most of our lines. But they're the good lines that have lots of red incidences. 
And now we play the same game with blue and green, um, except that we play it with J prime. And so we get an even smaller refinement that's still you know, most of the set of joints, uh, J double prime. Um, and these are, these are basically joints that lie on, on, I mean, that have, well, I'm going to abbreviate, lie on blue-green lines, blue and green lines, which meet about k and to the one-half uh, lines of LR. So, so we have um, most of our joints lying on blue and green lines that, that meet um, a fairly many lines of LR where the first refinement of joints lived. And so now what we do, we're at 10 minutes, great. So we pick we pick um, lines in LR randomly. We pick a random selection of lines in LR uh, with probability, picking each line with probability uh, 1 over 1 over k. I'm not doing the absolute sharp thing, but what I'll do is enough. So, so after I do this selection with positive probability, uh, each, uh, so, so I'll have, I guess, LR twiddle will be the random selection. And each line, um, each, um, I hadn't really define LB and LG, but I'll leave it to your imagination. Each, each line of these lines that met a lot of red lines at the beginning um, are now going to meet uh, n to the one-half, approximately n to the one-half uh, lines of, of LR. So, so the, av the expected number of lines you'd expect it to meet uh, would, be, would be n to the one-half, but you also have the law of large numbers, which means that there's going to be an exponential, an exponential tail, and there aren't so many lines that we have to check, so we can, we can do this. Um, and now, now we're in, in great shape because we have this random selection LR tilde and all of the, the blue and green lines meet LR tilde. And we can just pick points along the lines of LR tilde so that those lines will, will have the polynomial vanish on them. And then the polynomial will ban vanish on all the blue and green lines because they'll intersect those lines enough. So let's do the bookkeeping. Um, so there are n over k lines of LR. And let's just be really generous and pick in any way you like n points on each line. Oh, sorry, n to the one half, n to the one half, n to the one half points on each line. I can't be too generous. Um, so at this point, we have n to the three halves over k points, because I just have this set of lines and I put, put some points on them. And I let p be a polynomial of degree approximately n to the one half over k to the one third, which vanishes on these. n to the one half over k to the one third is less than n to the one half, so it vanishes, p vanishes on all lines of LR. Hence, on all lines of LB and LG. And so it, it vanishes on very many lines, and it vanishes on very many lines that are enough to make a large set of joints. And we're, we're now really in business. We have a polynomial of degree n to the one-half over k to the one-third that does this. And you know maybe we should even pause and ask ourselves, how on earth did this happen? It seemed to be magic that we can, we can get a lower degree polynomial than we expect for this set of points. The reason the magic worked is that we made such an, an insane assumption to begin with 
on how many joints there were, right? We made this really wild assumption that the joints conjecture was wrong. And that's what gave us this lower degree thing. So we have a polynomial. It's of degree uh, n to the 1 half over k to the 1 third. And if it were, say, to have, um, I lost the stylus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, if, if, OK, so, so p has degree uh, n to the 1 half over k to the 1 third. And now, if p were irreducible, we would actually be done. Um, because then p and the gradient of p would vanish jointly on about n lines, and this would be a, a contradiction. Uh, and the only thing left to worry about is that, well, maybe p isn't irreducible, right? We just picked p by solving a bunch of linear equations that were picked in a rather thoughtless way. Maybe p is reducible. Well, p is reducible doesn't hurt us so much either. Um, we now get to use uh, five minutes. Great. Um, we now get to use our last piece of high school algebra, the fact that I highlighted that multivariable polynomials are a unique factorization domain. So we just take our p and we factor it. Let's say each polynomial has degree, uh, some degree, so degrees d1 through dm. And the sum of these degrees is certainly less than uh, the degree of the whole polynomial, n to the 1 half over k to the, the 1 third. And now we define sets of joints, which are the sets of joints which p1 vanishes on, p2 vanishes on, pm vanishes on. Each joint gets vanished on by at least one of the, of the polynomials. So let jj be joints on which pj vanishes. And the size, I mean, the size of the sum of the sizes, I mean, sorry, the sum of the sizes of the sets of these is big, is at least uh, all the joints. So now you just pigeonhole this, right? You can, you can, find, you can find a j, you can find a, a subscript for which the ratio is at least as big as the ratio of the sums. And that turns out to be just fine, because even though you've now thrown out a lot of joints, you've also reduced your degree of your polynomial quite a bit. So you have a very low degree polynomial, and you only need it to vanish on as many points as its degree in order to vanish on the whole line. So since I'm down to about three minutes, is it three minutes? Four. Four, wow. Um, uh, since I'm down to about four minutes, I think I will not try to give any more details than that, because they'll come out illegible anyway. Um, and I will instead try to uh, explain uh, why it is that the other theorem is true, why Brigand's conjecture can be solved in a similar way. Let's see, do I still? Uh, OK, where, where it starts looking illegible. <laughs> Good. Um, OK, so the main idea in the proof of theorem 1 was that uh, you have three lines intersecting at a point non-coplanar. Non if the polynomial we look at vanishes on everything in sight, then the gradient has to vanish too. In Bourgain's problem, there's a requirement that you not have uh, more than n lines coplanar. But in fact, there's no reason at all to suspect, not to suspect that, say, three lines uh, could meet in a way that's coplanar at a point. Well, OK, there's one reason to suspect it. The reason to suspect it is that this is an analog of the Kakea problem. And in the Kakea problem, at least in some situations, there's a principle of planiness that you actually expect. In, in, uh, OK, so I mean, in fact, it's a reason to suspect that it will happen. You actually suspect that um, at most points of a Kakea set, a lot of lines will be intersecting in a plane. So what do we do about that? We, do, we, won't, we won't have the gradient vanishing necessarily, because maybe there's a tangent plane, and those lines all lie in the tangent plane. And in fact, part of the moral of this is that um, the, the, the tangent planes to the polynomial are what give us the planiness. Um, however, there's a great fact, which is that 2 plus 1 is more than 2. And what this fact tells us is that if we have 
three lines which intersect in a plane at a point that are in the zero set of a polynomial, uh, the degree two approximation to the polynomial contains them, and the degree one approximation to the polynomial contains them, which means by bazoo lines with two and one that uh, they have a common factor, which means that extrinsically the surface is flat. So what we get in place of the vanishing of the gradient is that we get this extrinsic flatness. Um, and so we have a certain set of polynomials which play the role of the second fundamental form. They're not quite the second fundamental form because they're not normalized. And we test them for common factors with our polynomial. And basically the same argument works. In fact, it's easier because you don't have to do this, this degree reduction trick that I emphasized. And I'm now essentially out of time, so I think I'll stop. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There's something very three dimensional about some of this. Uh, well, with curves, you should you should be able to to get somewhere because with with curves, uh, well, you don't have the statement that when d points uh, vanish, d plus one points vanish, you vanish, but uh, you get to multiply by the degree of the of the curve. What's wrong? I think you can do something about that. For example, if the curve is algebraic. Yes. Yes. No. If it's quadratic, then two d points. So that so so there is something you can do. Um, it, it contains the degree of the curves in it. <laughs>